We are extremely happy to welcome Julie Fernandez, Global HR Advisory Lead at Heron Palmer. Julie is a highly reputed global HR thought leader with deep expertise in multi-process HR, global payroll, and HR technology. She has been conferred multiple times with the title HR Superstar by HRO Today. She is focused on making HR transformation and innovation actionable. Let's welcome Julie Fernandez to share her thoughts on payroll benchmarking, tips, and tricks. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this year's session on payroll benchmarking. I'm Julie Fernandez, and after 20 years of delivering benchmarks to help HR and payroll leaders make decisions, I thought it might be fun to focus on some tips and tricks. I'll be available in chat throughout, so if you want to post your questions um, while the session is running, I'll be very happy to answer them um, real time. Benchmarks are one of the tools in an HR or payroll leader's tool belt. They can inform an assessment or strategic roadmap at the beginning of a transformation. They can sense check value or efficiency of operations today or in the future. And they can help us diagnose trouble spots or points of point to the areas of greatest opportunity for us. The trick with benchmarks really is knowing how to choose the right tool for the job. So in the next 20 minutes, my mission today is to help you identify different types of benchmarks and when you want to use each, um, and then to share tips to avoid bias and get awesome results. At the end, you'll see a call to action, which will include the survey um, that you can take. You'll get results um, later in February. Uh, and um, of course, I'll, I'll share my personal contact information in case you have any questions afterwards. All right, let's start with three very different types of benchmarks. I've pretty much made up some names here um, to help you compare and contrast them because you see most benchmark sources, they'll tell you what benchmarks they provide, but it's very much up to you to determine how to use those measures and if they're useful to you. Many benchmarks I see make me think, wow, or hmm, or that's great to know, but then they cause me to ask more questions. A great leader uses benchmarks purposefully to diagnose and then to set a course for action that's informed by the results. So let's dig in. Okay, I'm starting with something I've labeled as a function benchmarks because these are the types of things you most readily find from research firms that gather and publish data. APQC and Hackett maintain these sorts of ready-made databases. And for that same reason, HR leaders often ask me these questions as if the very answer will set them on their course, especially the last one. Sometimes it's called a staffing ratio. It's a calculation that's made to answer a not so simple question. If there are 8,000 people in my company, how many payroll resources should I have on my payroll team? These measures are popular because they point to cost efficiency, staff efficiency, staff productivity, the trick to using general functional benchmarks is in how you use them. Think for a moment about the answer. If you hear that it's best to practice, that it's best practice to spend $1.27 on payroll for every million dollars of company revenue, you're using a benchmark information that is going to compare your cost and efficiency to that of other internal functions like HR or finance or R&D or production. If I tell you the staffing ratio for your size or industry is one to 200, then you do some math for your 8,000 employees and come up with the conclusion that the right number of payroll FTE is 40. Most benchmark sources will then rank you by your magic number. So you can tell your boss whether you're top quartile or some other ranking that implies you have work to do. I like these types of benchmarks as a sense check. I really don't like them as a basis for making bigger strategic decisions. So let's look at why not. 
My top four cautions appear here in orange. It's difficult to normalize ready-made benchmark data. Remember, you may be doing data entry in payroll that the benchmarker assumes is done in HR. Or you could be reconciling bank accounts and general ledger details that the benchmark data captures in finance. Even greater variations can appear in matching your scale, your industry, and complexity to the data source, which often includes pretty much everybody. In the example of a 1 to 200 staffing ratio, which gave us the answer of 40 payroll FTEs, that answer could sound absurdly high if your payroll is outsourced. It could sound absurdly low if your employees are scattered across 40 different countries. So you see, the trick with as a function benchmarks is figuring out what they tell you and how to use them. All right, let's pick up the pace a little with performance benchmarks. You can see right from the examples that these are more targeted types of data that answer questions like how many, or how much time, or what percent. When you're using these measures, you're typically looking to evaluate accuracy. You're using them as a gauge to uh, evaluate your cycle times and responsiveness or to determine whether your process is efficient or whether you could benefit from more automation. Performance benchmarks are useful in gauging um, measures and gauging and measuring from period to period and figuring out whether you've improved the process any. And they're most commonly the types of measures that you're gonna find in operational court guards or service level agreements. The single best challenge to performance benchmarks is a way to track and measure them. For this reason, payroll providers usually have predefined data that they track and measure for their clients. Other sources might be surveys done by folks like the American Payroll Association or Bloomberg BNA, Deloitte, or other local industry groups. Mostly, you're looking to apply performance benchmarks to identify failures in the system. Note that sometimes special situations or complexities are a reason for performance below a target or average number. I started the payroll cycle timing here as an example. The first star reminds me that a pay date before the end of the pay period is a really good example of timing that is gonna ensure you'll have retroactive payroll adjustments just because the changes happen after payroll is already run. The second star reminds me to tell you of innovations like pay on demand which is gaining popularity in the US and may become a tool for rethinking the payroll measures altogether. After all, if employees can access earnings at any time without waiting for the fixed payroll date to run, will the timing of the pay cycle or the pay slip even matter? Okay, the last category I'm calling cost to deliver benchmarks, which is a bit silly because it's never only about cost, but if I'm honest, Cost efficiency is the biggest driver in payroll insights after the golden rule. It must be accurate and it must be on time. In this category, we're looking for benchmarks that answer specific questions about the different choices to make in delivering payroll. Using the payroll module that goes with your HR cloud solution versus a best of breed payroll software provider is an example of a technology choice um, that you can make in the payroll area that will impact um, how you experience and what the cost is to deliver. It can be the cost to buy outsourced payroll services, whether it's just the messy post payroll stuff or outsource the whole of it, and how those decisions impact the size of your retained payroll organization. So let's look at the um, attributes and the benefits. As you can see by the things we're measuring, these benchmarks are personal. They take your size and your scope and complexity into consideration and provide valuable information to understand the outcome of your choices, um, choices in technology or in shared services. The cost to deliver benchmarks are not ready-made lookup tables of data. They will require a method and steps to understand your situation so that a solid set of benchmark comparators can be brought forward to answer the questions like, is my cost to deliver payroll competitive? Or what would it cost to choose one technology over another or to outsource payroll in these five countries? The benchmarks in this category are my favorite because they answer the questions that HR and payroll leaders are being asked today. 
The cautions you see listed here in orange point mostly to being aware and informed about this more targeted set of data. In this space, quality and experience matter. The organization must have robust data points to draw from and also be disciplined about matching your situation to the data set that is the best match for you. Okay, let's take a look at three very, let's take a look again at the three very different types of benchmarks and review when and how you would use each of them. As a function, benchmarks will give you ratios and cost per stats that are made for big, broad comparisons. How do you compare? These are popular for situations where you're seeking confirmation that your payroll operations are top quartile or best practice. Be sure to ask yourself, compared to who? And what am I going to do with the results? I think most companies hope to find themselves at the top as confirmation that they can do nothing or tweak a little bit and keep refining things. As you saw in the example of pay on demand, I do see innovation and the new world of work beginning to challenge some of these measures. So performance benchmarks, they are the detailed and specific measures that you're going to apply initially and then from period to period as a tool to flag things that have gone off the rails, anomalies or problem areas. These are typically very diagnostic and very operational in nature. Scorecard measures and tracking that is meant to shine a light on areas that need to be refined or fixed. That's when you use performance benchmarks. And finally, the cost to deliver benchmarks. Data points used to support strategic alternatives, technology choices, outsourcing and shared services decisions. We're pointing to questions about the best way or a better way. We're evaluating the impact that larger decisions can have on quality and access to innovation. And for more and more companies, these help um, with decisions on how to move beyond domestic payroll for your largest population and what to do with the rest of world um, countries and how to maybe drive some synergies from that. All right, so we're in the home stretch here. Let's step back and look at six tips and tricks for awesome benchmark results. After all, if you're going to take the time and effort to benchmark, you want to know that it's going to provide the right insights and that you can make those actionable. Most of our session thus far focused on tip number one, take the time up front to think about the benchmarks that you need and not just the ones you can find. Second up, normalize for things that matter. I'm going to let you in on a big secret today. If you're benchmarking HR or payroll operations, industry alone does not matter half as much as the underlying characteristics of size, pay cycles, complexity, geography, degree of shared services, number of entities, union presence. If you find yourself telling your benchmarker, only compare me to other retail companies, you're unlikely to get great results. Industry is important for many things. It is not a key differentiator in HR or payroll administration. Third tip, <clears throat> you should not need to worry or collect granular data from every country and location in order to perform a benchmark ass assessment. Be pragmatic. Think about meaningful assumptions that you can make. And yes, sure, collect some data. But if you're being told that you need to send an army of folks into every country and location in order to collect all the granular details and, and information, you should probably stop and think. Benchmarks can help figure out first what's actionable and next where you may want or need to flush out the details. My number four trick will save you a lot of extra effort and hassle as well. The, as leaders, we're pretty resourceful. We're even scrappy, I would say. Payroll providers are a valuable source of information, and those you use today may even offer to provide insights for free. Use them wisely, but also recognize as soon as you reach out to explore new countries or new topics, you trigger a sales cycle. Know what you're looking for before you engage them, and especially before you engage many of them. And determine up front what you're willing to share as a part of fishing for information. And be very clear about what you won't share. Okay, next up. Benchmarks are one of the greatest tools in the toolbox, but what a waste of to get them and then not really know what to do with them. 
Even more important to payroll decisions is buy-in. There is no back, off function, back office function that has more stakeholders. Um, and they have very different areas of focus and um, importance, um, important objectives for payroll. HR, finance, treasury, IT, shared services, operations. If you are not a master navigator of the organization, find someone who is as a champion. Decisions and change are not for the faint of heart in this space. And this will lead me to the last tip for the day. Um, get some level of guidance for any journey, especially one that crosses countries. Your greatest payroll resources at headquarters or your most talented folks in shared services may not fully understand the inner workings of a regional or a global model and the challenges of local process and compliance and payroll. Resources with this expertise are actually not an easy find. Okay, this is it. Speaking of awesome results, you have an opportunity to provide valuable input to a 2022 survey that will gather and analyze how organizations are making strategic decisions about payroll as HR moves to the cloud. Participate in a short survey of 20-ish questions run by a neutral third party, which means no ties to any technology or provider. I think you will um, find a drawing with some cash prizes, but honestly, you'll have to scan the QR code on the slide for more details um, as I don't have those quite flushed out by the time of today's recording. The survey should really only take about 15 minutes to complete. In return, though, you'll receive the final report published in February, early March, that describes what other organizations like you are doing with their payroll what they do with their systems, their shared services, outsourcing, automation, free benchmarks and information that you can use as a starting point to compare your payroll delivery model with that of your peers. Taking this survey will not put you on any list given to a world of vendors who are going to follow up with sales materials. Um, so um, get your phone out and uh, find the camera and scan the QR code to get to the link um, to take the survey. All right, that's it. Our time today was pretty short. Um, thanks to everyone who participated in chat as this session was um, was uh, occurring. And um, please, my contact information is here. Feel free to reach out to me anytime. Um, and uh, with any questions that you might have about your payroll organization, benchmarks, benchmark sources, um, and uh, what you might need in order to answer the questions that you have. Mm -hmm.